Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Okay, welcome back. So we're going to continue our discussion in this lecture of this traditional MOSFET model that we developed in the previous lecture. And I'm going to show how that simple two-piece model can be extended into a real model that does a good job of matching the IV characteristics of present-day transistors. And this virtual source model is going to provide a conceptual framework that we're going to use as we go out, go throughout the remainder of the course. So the model itself was developed by at MIT, and this is an example of the kind of fits that it provides to current day technology, you know, 32 nanometer technology, and uh, it, it really has proven to be remarkably successful at describing a wide variety of not only silicon, but also 3.5 and even graphene transistors. So although it is semi-empirical, it seems to capture something about the essential physics of MOSFET that make it widely applicable. So let's recall what we were doing in the last lecture. We developed this very simple two-piece approximation for the IV characteristic. We had a simple expression for the linear current. We had a simple expression for the saturated current. Those two currents intersected at a critical voltage we'll call VD sat, and we had a simple expression for VD sat. And now our question is, can we extend this model and make it a smooth and continuous model that describes the IV characteristics better? Okay. So the two-piece model, you know, we can easily apply it. We just apply a drain to source voltage and we ask, are we less than VD sat? Are we bigger than VD sat? And we use the appropriate expression. But we'd like a smooth connection between those two regimes. And the question is, you know, how do we do that? How do we connect those two pieces smoothly? Now, we could do this mathematically, but then it gets very complicated and involves additional simplifying assumptions. Or we could do it empirically. And that's the uh, essence of the virtual source model. It makes this connection empirically. So we have some physical expressions for the linear and saturated current, and we're now going to empirically connect these two. So let's see how we do that. So let's go back to the small drain voltage. This was our expression for the linear current, the current for small drain voltage. If I just rewrite that a little bit, it's current per unit width. That's why we always express these currents as microamps per micrometer or whatever. And I can write, I can pull the C ox VG minus VT out front because that's the charge. And then I can pull the mu and drain voltage divided by L, that's the electric field. So when I write it that way, what we've written it at as is current per unit width is charge times velocity. Very simple expression. And the velocity under low drain to source voltage is just mobility times the constant electric field in the channel. Okay, let's look at large drain voltage. Our saturated current expression looks like this. We can rewrite that as the current per unit width, bring the C ox VG minus VT out front because that's the charge, and then we have V sat. So again, I can write the current per unit width as charge times average velocity, and the average velocity in this case is just the high field saturated velocity in this traditional model. Okay, so we have an IV expression then. We can always write the current as charge times velocity. Above threshold, we'll use this simple expression for charge. Below threshold, we'll ignore the charge and just assume that there is no charge. Later on, we'll have to go back next week when we talk about MOS electrostatics and try to do a better job at that so that we can describe the subthreshold characteristics. But for now, we'll just assume that there is no charge below threshold. And then we have expressions for the velocity under small drain voltage and under high drain voltage, and we'd like to smoothly make that transition in average velocity from one to the other. And here's the way that we do it in the virtual source model. We introduce an empirical function. It's physics motivated, but the physical underpinnings are just a little bit weak. But the expression looks like this. We'll discuss in a slide or two why that expression makes some sense. 
but it's an empirical expression. It's drain voltage divided by VD sat, and we have an expression for that, over one plus drain voltage divided by VD sat to some power beta, and then the whole quantity to the power one over beta. So that's an empirical expression. And you know, let's take a look and see what that does. If the drain voltage is very small, then in the denominator I can ignore it with regard to the one, and this F sat function just ends up being drain voltage divided by VD sat for small drain voltage. That means that the average velocity is just VD divided by VD sat, drain voltage saturation, divided by the high field saturation velocity. But we have an expression for the drain saturation voltage. Plug the expression in, and we end up having the average velocity is mobility times electric field, and that's exactly what it's supposed to be. So this empirical expression for small drain voltage gives us the correct answer. Okay, what about large drain voltage? So for large drain voltage, you can see that we can ignore the one in the denominator, and then the beta to the power one over beta will just give us one, and the saturation function will approach one. Now the average velocity is just 1 times Vsat, so it's Vsat, and that's exactly what it's supposed to be under high drain bias. So this empirical saturation function has the right value at the two limits, and this, semi, this empirical parameter beta, which is typically 1.5 to 2 or so, controls the transition between the two regimes. Now, Let's see if we can understand a little bit what this saturation function is all about. Physically, I would think that whichever velocity is the smaller is the one that matters and is going to limit the current. So I could say that the, the, aver the actual average velocity, one over the actual average velocity, is one over the linear regime velocity plus one over the saturated velocity. Whichever one of those two is smaller is going to be the one that's important in this sum, and that's going to be the one that dominates. So this would be a plausible way to get a smooth, a smooth connection between the two regimes. And if you simply solve this for the average velocity, you'll get an expression that looks like that. That's very much like the FSAT function that we saw previously. The only difference now is that we're missing the beta and one over beta. And that empirical parameter beta just gives us an adjustment that controls the sharpness of the transition between the two regimes and allows us to fit the wide variety of transistors. Okay, so uh, this extra parameter, you know, it typically doesn't vary a lot, Be typically between 1.6 and 1.8 for n-channel MOSFETs and roughly 1.4 for p-channel MOSFETs, but it's a parameter that we adjust for the particular device to get the best fit to the IV characteristics. So, although this is an empirical parameter, it does produce a smooth curve, it does the right thing, and in practice it works remarkably well. So I'm going to call this the level zero virtual source model. Step by step, we're going to make this more sophisticated. So the level zero model writes the current as charge times velocity. We use a very simple expression for the charge, ignoring the, exp the uh, charge below the threshold voltage. We use an empirical expression for the average velocity that has an empirical parameter one over beta. And there are only five parameters in this model, and these five parameters have very clear physical significance. There's the gate oxide capacitance per square centimeter, there's the threshold voltage, there's the high field saturation velocity, there's the effect of mobility, and there's the length of the channel. So with those five parameters, it turns out that in practice, you can do a very good job of fitting the IV characteristics of modern transistors if we're allowed to adjust Vsat and mu effective a little bit and think of them as semi-empirical. Okay. So the five steps are current, charge, average velocity, saturation function, and VD set. Okay, so let's think about how we would improve this model and make it better. And we're not, we can't do it all in this lecture, but we'll do it step by step. So one of our assumptions is that 
we have no charge below threshold. The leakage current when the device is off is very, very important these days. We're going to need to develop an expression for the charge below threshold, and that means we're going to need to understand MOS electrostatics in a little bit of detail. That's what the next couple of lectures are all about. We're also going to find that above threshold, the slope of this line is not the oxide capacitance. It's the gate capacitance, and it's somewhat less than the oxide capacitance. We'll have to understand what that's all about, too. Now, in the output regime, we don't have a zero slope. We have a finite slope. We'll have to make sure that our model treats that, too, and, and that'll be relatively easy to do, and the physics is easy to understand. Uh, one of the things that we're going to have to be very careful about is the fact that any real device has series resistance. If we put metal contacts on the source and the drain, there's inevitably some series resistance that's added there. There's some resistance in the source and the drain themselves before the current gets out to metal contact. What we've been talking about really are the IV characteristics of the intrinsic device, assuming that there are none of those extra resistances. So let me just label now the voltages that I've been talking about are the voltages on the intrinsic terminals of the, of the device. So I'll label them with primes now. And uh, we have an expression for the drain current in terms of the intrinsic voltages that get into the heart of the device. The real transistor has these extra resistances. And I'm not going to draw one for the gate because there's really no significant current flowing through the gate terminal, so there's no significant voltage drop there. Uh, under AC conditions, that resistance is important, but not under DC conditions. So the actual voltages that we apply to the drain, source, and gate terminal are different than the voltages that actually get into the heart of the device, and we have to account for that. Okay. I won't go through the details, but it's just a little bit of circuit analysis, and it's relatively straightforward. There is no voltage drop here, so the gate voltage is the intrinsic gate voltage. The intrinsic drain voltage, it's just the drain voltage minus the voltage drop due to the drain current flowing through that drain series resistance. And the intrinsic source voltage is the source voltage plus the voltage drop across the series resistance in the source. So there's a simple relation. The drain current is in terms of the intrinsic voltages, and we can relate the intrinsic voltages to the extrinsic voltages with some simple circuit analysis. Well, actually, this is two equations in two unknowns. So given the drain, the applied voltage on the actual drain terminal, source terminal, and gate terminal, we can solve these two equations for the two unknowns, which are the intrinsic voltages across the source and the drain. And that requires some nonlinear Newton Raphson iteration, but it's a relatively straightforward process. So we can do the correction numerically, and it's, it's easy to add the effects of these series resistances. Now, just to talk about what the resistances do, if I had a transistor with no series resistance, I'd have an intrinsic device, and I'd have some IV characteristic, and the equations we have for the current refer to this intrinsic device. So we have some channel resistance, the slope in the small VDS regime, and we have some on current. What happens if there are series resistances present? Well, we'll get less current. So, and it's relatively easy to understand what happens. The slope in the low VDS regime is not just the resistance of the channel, we also have to add the series resistance of the source and the drain. It just gives us a higher resistance in that regime. If I look at the on current, it's lower than the intrinsic on current. And the reason it's lower is because the on current goes as W oxide capacitance Vsat times VGS minus VT. But the actual voltage between the gate and the source is the gate voltage minus the source voltage, but the source voltage is increased by this voltage drop across the series resistance in the source. So the gate to source voltage is smaller, meaning I get a smaller drain current. So that's what the extrinsic resistances do, just lower the overall currents. In fact, you can show with just a little bit of algebra that the fractional lowering of the on current from the, from, uh, from the measured on current is just the ratio of the series resistance to something I'll call the on resistance. 
and the on resistance is just the drain voltage minus the threshold divided by the on current. So there are simple expressions that we can estimate what the effect of these series resistances are, and if we want to calculate it properly, we just solve these two equations and two unknowns and determine the intrinsic voltages and plug them into our expressions. Okay, so with these kind of extensions, sub-threshold conduction, which we can't do until we talk about MOS electrostatics in more detail, finite output resistance, which when we talk about 2D electrostatics, we'll be able to, to treat, and series resistance, which we've just discussed, then this virtual source model is a very good way to describe modern transistors. Okay. Now, we have to view this high field saturation velocity as some kind of empirical parameter. We also have to view this effective mobility as some kind of empirical parameter because it really only makes physical sense when the channel is many mean free paths long. And we also need to use the measured gate capacitance, which in general is less than the oxide capacitance. And we'll talk about why in the next lecture or two. But, you know, quite surprisingly, this model, with just a little bit of adjustment of these parameters, that was developed on physics that was very firm and solid in the 1960s, 70s, and early 80s, still does a remarkably nice job of describing modern day transistors. Now, there's a very simple reason that the transistor is a barrier control device and that was built into the first model. It's just that the magnitude of the currents need to be adjusted a little bit because of the breakdown in some of the physical concepts. Now, what we're going to find is that these these parameters acquire a very clear physical meaning. And that's what the course is all about. We will find that the saturation velocity is replaced by something we'll call the injection velocity. And we'll talk about what that means later in the course. And that the actual mobility of carriers in the inversion layer is replaced by something we call the apparent mobility. But the apparent mobility has a very clear physical interpretation. Now, now, we might just mention why this is called the virtual source. So, it's based on this idea of barrier control. It's based on evaluating the current at the top of the barrier. And the top of the barrier is a place where the charge is given by standard MOS electrostatics by a very simple expression. The charge is C ox VG minus VT. Not always, but it's very close to that if we design a transistor well. So that point where the charge is always maintained at that very simple value is called the virtual source. And that's where we evaluate the current and do all of our bookkeeping. Okay. So the goal for the rest of the course is now is to talk about the physics, to go beyond the 1960s, 70s, and early 80s physics and talk about physics that's appropriate for these very small devices and to do this in a way that we can take this virtual source model and help it evolve it into something that is very physical and sound and applicable to modern transistors. So the next task uh, that we need to address in this course is to have a clear understanding of MOS electrostatics. Because remember, the most important thing about a transistor is manipulating these energy barriers. Once we understand how to manipulate energy barriers and how to treat MOS electrostatics, then we'll look at transport, ballistic transport and quasi-ballistic transport. But first, we'll discuss MOS electrostatics. So thank you, and uh, we'll continue with the discussion on MOS electrostatics in the next lecture.